Good evening, ESD family. We are back. Another episode of Empire State of Baseball. This is episode number 76, March 18th of the year 2024. We are airing on Twitch, X, YouTube, and powered by StreamYard. Well, gentlemen, this is finally the last full week without baseball for our two teams. We actually have some games in Korea in the middle of the week. Again, I hate, I absolutely despise that you have teams starting the regular season and then go back to play spring training games. I think it's absolutely yeah, terrible. I hate it. That's a different conversation, but I am happy. This is the last full week without our teams. Joe, how are you feeling on this March evening? I'm feeling great, Corey. I uh, had my St. Patrick's Day fill for all my I fellow Irishmen. I know my name doesn't look Irish, but I am half Irish uh, uh, this past it. weekend. So I've eaten corned beef the last four days. I took a little Prove break it. today, and I got leftovers tomorrow. But I'm feeling good, and I can't I can't agree with you more. The, the fact that we're playing regular season games in Korea the next two days or whatever it is, and then going back to spring training oh. <laughs> to go back to the regular season is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my entire life. It's it's they it's gotta insane. figure that crap out because it's what getting a, old. What a tease. What a tease for 28 other teams in baseball playing normal all exhibition games, and yet the yep. Dodgers and Padres have taken all the fun in Korea. Uh, it, it's going to be something else to watch those games. And for fantasy purposes, I mean, Corey, I know you talked about this a couple weeks ago, how it's screwing up the week one of fantasy Big baseball time. across the leagues. But Thomas, how are we doing on this Monday? Happy belated St. Patty's Day. It's good. We're, we're back from, uh, we're back from spring training. Got to see some, some fun things. I do. I did bring something back that either Corey or Joe will have to share. Which, which one of you guys wants this Philly St. Patrick's Day koozie? <laughs> <laughs> they gave him out um which was nice and whatever you guys whatever whichever you guys want it i uh i, I brought this home for you thomas okay. you're, you're so 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 generous well tonight's episode is going to be a fun one i know Corey, you're going to run through the lineup in a little yep. bit uh as part of our preseason series we're already winding down our preseason series only have two episodes left before we get into regular season action uh but before uh, we touch on the lineup and, of course, big segment tonight, that are 2024 MLB predictions. Uh, live stream, yes. Uh, we're streaming on three different platforms, Twitch, X, and YouTube, but the party's over here on YouTube. So if you're on Twitch and X, thank you so much, but come on over and join the party and a great chat here on YouTube. We're trying to build momentum off our fantastic episode from last week where we had up to 130 live viewers on the show. We thank you so awesome. much for making history with us last week. We want to continue to make this momentum, uh, ride on that momentum here on this March 18th uh, for Monday. And uh, let's shout out uh, uh, from some of the members from the chat before, Corey, again, you take the lineup uh, as you always do. Uh, shout out to my guy, TC Steels over at Yanks Brew. Give him a follow at Yanks Brew. TC is the man. Thank you so much. Damian Serrano, my guy, he's got the best chain. I'm actually wearing my chain to, to tribute to Damian Serrano, another uh, panelist and member of the Morning Brew Sports family. What's going on, Damian? We also have Chris N. over at Yankees Pod. Give him a follow at Yankees Pod. He does such a great job hosting the show with Jimmy Rendazzo and the boys. We have Sierra Petit in the house. I don't know related to Cody Petit uh, over the Yankees. I don't know if the spelling's right. But woohoo! Yeah, I'm with you. It's Monday and it's Empire State of Baseball. We got Joey Bag of Donuts. <laughs> Was my favorite item on the Moe's menu on a Tuesday. My real ones know that one. We got real and real LD50. Hey, hey, what's going on? Uh, Morning Brew Sports and a lot of shout outs to kick off. Guys, you guys are amazing. Morning Brew Sports, give a follow at Brew Crew Sports, Yankees Brew. Our guy, NFE, yo, 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 was actually on NFE show on Saturday. He was awesome. Go, ESB, go. That's Alana. Thank you so much, Alana. Shout out to you, Alex Pagan. Yo, yo, yo. It's a lot of love here on Empire State of Baseball. But Corey Favs, we got the fans in the building. Tell them what we got in store for tonight's show. Uh, for tonight's show, lineup card presented by Roback. And Tom's got more information on Roback after. So what do we got? Yeah, so for tonight's show, we got two primary segments we'll be running through. First will be the Empire Express, where we will give you the latest on the New York Mets and the New York Yankees. We have some opening day news, which we'll get to momentarily. And then we'll be wrapping up the show with our 2024 MLB full 
uh, season predictions. We had a really great time doing that prediction show last year, and it's really cool to look back on it as you get to the halfway point, as you get to the end of the season, to see how these predictions hold up. I know last year, and I know a lot of Yankee fans in the chat right now, I did have Garrett Cole as my Cy Young prediction last year. It did come true. Um, so we'll see if some of our other predictions come true this year for both our teams. Uh, but anyway, on the Empire Express, as I mentioned before, we do have opening day news for both teams. And in terms of who will be pitching, it is not the two pitchers you'd be expecting for both teams. You would expect for the Mets, it is Kodai Sanga. It is not Kodai Sanga. We know he is still out with an injury, probably won't be back until sometime in May. So it was announced that Jose Quintana will take the opening day nod. And on the Yankee side of the house, Garrett Cole. The big thing I called about Cole last year when why I gave him the Cy Young because I could trust him to go and pitch 30-plus starts year in and year out. And this is going to be the first year in a long time he's not pitching 30 starts. Uh, it's going to be uh, Nestor Cortez. I know uh, there was some mm -hmm. talks. Would it be Marcus Stroman? Uh, you know, could it be uh, Rodon? But it is going to be Nestor Cortez taking the ball for the Yankees on opening day. Uh, we'll start first quickly on the Mets. Again, Jose Quintana gets the nod. There was some debate. Could it be a Tyler McGill? Uh, could it be someone else? But I think Jose Quintana was probably the safest choice to take the ball for the New York Metropolitans. Again, Jose Quintana mm -hmm. is not an ace. He is not a number two starter. He is a number five, maybe a number four on a good day. But that's the case of the Mets rotation right now. Kodai Senga, when he's healthy, sure, he's your ace. He's probably a number two on a good team. And then they have a lot of four and five starters. So, Joe, how are you feeling about Jose Quintana getting the nod on opening day? Yeah, I mean, once Senga went down, we kind of knew that the Mets options were limited. Uh, McGill's not going to go from fighting for a rotation spot to all of a sudden being the opening day starter. They're not going to mess with Severino's scheduling at all, given his injury history and everything like that. Quintana is, whether we like it or not, basically the veteran of the rotation and of the team uh, uh, starting pitchers. Listen, you know, he's a veteran. The moment's not going to be too big for him. He's a good, solid choice. And and to get him started on the right foot, especially after last year where he missed basically the first half of the season, I, I think this is a good move for the Mets. I think it's the right choice given that Senga is hurt. Um, and I expect Quintana to go out there and 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 have a good opening day. Uh, the Mets record on opening day is fantastic. It's best in baseball. Um, you know, so it's always going to be that's continue with Quintana taking the pill. Well, I mean, Quintana you know, stinks. The mess, I, mess I, rotation I, is, is, is a massive, a, a little question. strong. Uh, stinks stinks is a little strong. strong. That's out of pocket there, Thomas. Quintana is all right. I mean, I honestly, I wonder if I trust Quintana more than Rodon, and that's a completely different conversation. Although he did have a very I mean, good outing in his I mean, uh, recent outing. That's a wild. I mean, you say health-wise, but I mean. Last year, last year in 13 games, 3.57 ERA. That's exactly the year before you had 2.93 ERA. The guy knows how to pitch. 12 and, games. And that's, it, it is in 12 games and you hope to get 28 to 30 out of him this year. But the guy knows how to pitch. He's going to keep you in games. He's not going to blow guys away. He's not throwing 98, 99 miles an an hour he's there to control the game and give you a good six innings that's he's, what I'm he's a I fine think. three or four starter if he, if he if he's gonna be your number one for a, a chunk of the season without without saying it there i just don't see the mets being able to hold teams under five six runs a game like that they're a pitching staff is dreadful i know you got some young guys that you have some hope for but that's that's terrible and i'll tell you what on paper i mean i agree because on paper, I said multiple times on the show that this is probably the Mets' worst starting rotation, potentially in my lifetime on paper. Uh, now, in spring training, what, what's crazy about spring training is they've been absolutely lights out. Now, I know in the mm -hmm. last couple of starts, you saw Quintana get hit around a little bit. McGill finally had a rough outing, but he's been red hot, Tyler McGill. Uh, but you could do a lot worse than Jose Quintana and see the fans absolutely crushing him after one bad outing in spring. Again, he's not an ace. He's not a number two pitcher. He's not a number three pitcher. He's a back of the rotation starter being asked to fill the void and pitch opening day. Uh, and honestly, you could do a lot worse than Quintana. Uh, you could do a lot better than Quintana, but at least he's a proven MLB pitcher who could take the ball. 
Uh, and in terms of Kodai Senga, they made the announcement seven to 10 days uh, that he'll uh, hopefully resume throwing. Uh, a little bit of a delay from the initial timeline. But again, I'm honestly not concerned. Give him the week. This puts him right on track to return sometime in May, which mm -hmm. is honestly what all of us were hoping for. We went it down to begin with. So let him take some rest. They said it's not a setback. He doesn't feel any issues right now. It's not like something popped up randomly. They're giving him the little more rest to go through this weekend. And best case scenario, we wake up uh, a week from now and Senga's throwing because uh, this well, Sunday is a 10-day mark. It's not a setback, but we're just setting the timetable back. Is that what we're saying? Well, he didn't have, he didn't re-injure it. He doesn't feel any pain. They're just giving, and they didn't, the thing with the Mets too, is like, they didn't say, oh, he's going to resume throwing in exactly three weeks. They said they're going to reevaluate it in three weeks. So they reevaluated it and they're saying, all right, seven to 10 days will resume throwing. So they never formally committed to him throwing in, uh, in the three week window. Fair. So. I, th I think you'll see. I think you'll see Sanga May first. I, I I think at the rate he's okay. going, if he starts throwing by the end of this week, uh, you give him about a month to three to four full weeks to to ramp up again. Um, assuming there's no setback, I think that's what you're going to get. That's 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 the target date that you're going to see for Sanga. Yep. And listen, if he misses April and he's good for the rest of the season, you give him. You take that extra two weeks to make sure he's good, to make sure there's no mm -hmm. pain and discomfort, so you can save an extra month. Because if he has that setback at this point, it's going to cost you an extra month. So you always, especially during yep. this time of the year, go, give him that extra week that you may not need to give him just to make sure that you have him for the majority of the season. Exactly. Nope, I couldn't agree well, more with that. I and as we said that. Well, I was so going to say, well, at least you're seeing your number one pitcher in your rotation by May 1st there, Joe, because the number one mm. pitcher in our rotation probably won't be seen until maybe late May, early yeah. June at the earliest. But the Garrett Cole update to continue and transition over to the Yankee side of the house of the Empire Express. Uh, Brian Hoke rep uh, reported the other day, Garrett Cole uh, said that he is dealing with nerve inflammation and edema. Uh, three to four weeks, no throw, and we'll go from there. Uh, I think we determined that we just got a little too hot, a little too quick this spring. Now, uh, Garrett Cole, obviously, with his announcement and him starting the year off on the IL, leads to not Stalin Marte, but it leads to Nestor Cortez picking up the opening day start. It would be something else Stalin Marte got the opening day start. That would uh, be a, a, a definitely be something. change there. Uh, <laughs> Nestor in. Cortez going to draw the opening day start in Houston. A uh, bit of a surprise uh, for a lot of Yankee fans out there. Uh, I don't think Nestor was expecting, you know, I think traditionally – if your number one pitcher goes down, boom, your number two pitcher is getting the ball uh, for that first game of the season. Uh, but it does seem like Rodon was kept on his throwing schedule. Uh, and, and to be honest, seeing how Rodon's pitched over the last couple of days, and there's a lot of love right now for Carlos Rodon in our chat as we speak. Uh, like my man forever ghost, uh, Rodon slander doesn't belong here. And listen, Carlos Rodon over his last two starts has looked great. And I think whatever they got going on with Carlos, they got to keep going. I don't think you mess with that. And they didn't ask him to be the opening day starter there. So you still got to run with him at the number two. Mm -hmm. However, another pitcher was asked uh, to fulfill that number one spot. And I know Joe is going to get really into it. But, Tom, what are your thoughts here on, on Nestor Cortez taking the bump for game one in Houston? My thought is Joe is going to try to blow something out of proportion as he usually does. Who cares who starts opening day? It's not Marcus Stroman didn't say no to pitching game one of the ALDS. He said, "Listen, I'm on. I'm on a schedule, and I would like to. I would like to stay on my schedule. Who who cares what yeah. game one of 162 is? You you know who else was on a schedule? Garrett Cole. All right, but the problem with Strowman and this we just said we we this just is, said we don't care that Rodon listen, wants to stay on his schedule. Why is Strowman? Just well, why is it okay for he, Nestor, he who had an injury plague season last year, to go off of his schedule to move to an open day start? Listen, Strowman can adjust two days and not kill himself." Uh, to, to make the adjustment, your age matter. just went down. You're the new guy on the block. You've been in New York. The New York fans don't like you to begin with. It would you have been like like, it would have been a great thing don't for put that on to me. say, I'll take the ball. I'll fill in the spot. Instead, not only did he not take the ball, he's now made a spectacle of why he can't take the ball. You know he didn't. Right? Yeah, he is, he's going in the press. He's saying, I got my schedule. and I got my schedule. I, I prefer you know, to stick whatever. to my schedule. It's, All that's it's not 
listen, if if the, the Yankees are day, if the Yankees are 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 fortunate enough to make the playoffs, and we are in this exact spot, and Marcus Stroman says, "Listen, I don't want to pitch game one. I want to pitch game three because of my schedule." I will I will come on this podcast and one be happy the Yankees make the playoffs, but two I will crucify him for that. That is not he's not pitching opening day. Who who cares? It, it, it's it's the fact that the team asked you after they lost their premier pitcher to 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 take to take the the mounds game one. You also don't know how that no, conversation. Went. I'm I'm just saying a conversation that, that, like, hey, we, would we you mind getting off back. your schedule if you're if not, it's cool. And he was maybe like, yeah, I, I would rather listen stick to my schedule. It's, that, it's, it's it is it couldn't be less of an Strowman, issue. Strowman is always about him and what's best for him, not the team. And I warned you guys sure about being a Met anymore. I warned you about this. Me and Corey warned you about this. We love him when he's pitching on the mound, but you asked Stroman to go out of his way for you to change anything that bothers him. He's going to tell you no, and he's going to leave you. Guess what? In game five, if you have an injury to your pitching rotation in the NLDS and you ask him to go on three or four days rest, he's going to tell you no. I, because you know that's what? the kind and of guy if we he get is. there, we'll, we'll have that is, conversation. But we're not there. This is the start. This is starting the season off on the wrong way. This is you being and this a bitter Met fan. And I'm warning you guys, you Yankee fans, this is what you expect from this guy. Nope. It, when this guy is – when you here. ask this guy to, to d- sacrifice for you. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. He – is not going to do it. And the Yankees needed him to take opening day. And no, they didn't. No, that's <laughs> a sign of things to come. And guess I what? The, guy, an opener. Who the, cares? Guys in the, the, the guys in the clubhouse know. The guys in the clubhouse know. When when their number is called, they know Stroman said no. So no. don't think that some guys in the clubhouse didn't like that. They well, just watched Eric Cole Empire out State for two months. <laughs> and this guy can't wow. move up two days? Come on. I will say this too. Rodon could have moved up one day. So why yeah. why aren't you giving Rodon shit? Again, Sorry. Rodon missed half the year last year. I at least give the uh, Rodon uh, a pass because he missed half the season. You're trying to get the guy on the mound to begin with. Stroman doesn't have that problem. Well, I will say this when it comes to opening day, and I, I have two thoughts. Uh, one somewhat in line with Tom, and one somewhat in line with Joe. Uh, starting Part of on your the- point sounds like it's going to be smart. Yeah, so I'm going to start first with the Joe side, too. And when you're three weeks out and talking about schedules, I honestly think it's a load of crap. Uh, you yeah. Anything could happen. A player could get hurt. You could have multiple rainouts in a row. Uh, now, the Yankees open up in Minute Maid Park, so you don't have to worry about a rainout. But you never know. There could be a hurricane. It, it, you, know, you, you never know what could happen. This time of year. Uh, but, not know. this time of year, but you get my point. So yeah. three weeks out, anything could happen. I think it's completely different. If Stroman pitched on a on a Monday night and then you're asking him to open the day Thursday, that's a completely different thing with scheduling. So uh, in general, three weeks out, I think it's a load of crap. Uh, whether or not it's Stroman being Stroman, I don't know. Uh, but then when it comes to opening day too, honestly, at the end of the day, it cares in the moment, but doesn't matter in the long run. And I look back to 2015 with the New York Mets as an example here. Bartolo Colon open for the Mets in 2015 and the Mets got so much hate because Bartolo Colon was not a mainstay with the team. He was only with the team for one year at that point. You had so many young pitchers who you thought would have got the job. Uh, They got a lot of hate. And what happened? The Mets won the game. They went to the World Series that year. So honestly, whoever pitches opening day in the grand scheme of things doesn't really matter because when you get to June, you don't even remember opening day unless you went there in person. So uh, I I see both of the support and the negative in terms of uh, the Strowman situation, too. I think the schedule thing is a load of crap that far out. But at the same time, who matters? Nestor Cortez goes out and get the win. Yankee fans will be happy. It's, I want to. Let's be get clear. The it's here. not. It's not the fact that it's opening day. It's the fact that the the Yankees. The fact that Joe still team, hates Marcus Strowman. It's that the fact bad. that the Yankees and the team uh, asked him uh, to step up, and he said no. no. Joe, and this like, isn't this isn't high school sports where it's like, like we need you to take the rock on the opening day. All the fans, it's like it doesn't matter. Okay, guys. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta jump in because I have a couple comments here I want to throw in. Uh, Sierra over here, Empire State of Baseball. Marcus Stroman will start in the Bronx. No biggie. We love Stroman over here. Chill with the slander guy. 
Uh, then we got, let's see here from Damian Serrano. If this was the playoffs, best believe Schoen would be the first to be asked for the ball. I'm... Schoen was a Yankees fan his whole life. He broke the locker room and traded to the Mets. All right, so here's my take on this whole thing because I kind of talked about this on – uh, I got and pictures shout out of to my him guys. in the Met jersey when he was a kid. No, can I get in here, my man? I'm just chilling. Uh, I was on NFE and Uncle Tats' show on uh, Saturday, so shout out to them. Great content creators over at the Pinstripe Express. Uh, and we did bring up the showman uh, controversy, to say the least. Here's my thing with, the, with this whole thing. The hypothetical is if this opening day was not in Houston and it was in Yankee Stadium, showman's taking the ball. Because to him, there's more of an honor to open up against – open up for the Yankees in Yankee Stadium in pinstripes. I'm not denied. I'm not going to use this, the the throwing program as a mask here because if Stroman wanted the ball on opening day uh, in, in front of the his, his, his home crowd in New York at Yankee Stadium, and it was March 28th, he was taking the ball. So I, I kind of don't want to hear the, the reasoning behind it being, oh, he's a creature of habit and he wants to stick to his throwing program because – if that game is the Yankee Stadium, he's taking the ball, no, no doubt about it. And if you look Absolutely. at it, the first seven games, the first get seven games of the season, all on the road. If Stroman takes the ball, game one, he's probably missing that first set at Yankee Stadium. He's certainly not getting the the home opener, and he's also not pitching against his former team, the Toronto Blue Jays. So I think there's a two part to it where he not only wants the ball, but he wants to face his former team uh, that grew him up in the organization. So I think it's a bit of that, and I think he's masking it a little bit with the with the throwing program here. And I know I'm probably going to get killed by my own Yankee fans here, but I think that's the truth there. And I almost kind of wish it was like a little bit more upfront, or better yet, that this conversation was never leaked to begin with, which I think uh, whatever happened there, poor job. It should have been thrown out there. You know, Strowman again, he's trying to work his way up to Yankee fans after the back and forth on social media over the last few years, going at the fans, going at the organization. And listen, a lot of it is inflicted by the, the general manager himself and Brian Cashman. So I think that was a conversation that certainly should not have been leaked. Uh, but again, opening day has got to be an honor. And I'm, I I'm, was surprised that Marcus didn't want to take the ball, but at the same time, he still is going to win me over with his performance at the end of the day. And if he, if he wants to use the throwing program as as his reasoning, then so be it. I mean, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna start this fight on Mark I, Stroman. I think the I think the home opener thing is a bunch of nonsense. You're pitching in the AL East. You're gonna play the Blue Jays multiple times this year, and you got pitching Yankee Stadium half your starts. That's just the facts. So the idea that he won in Game Three because it's the home opener versus the other thing that shouldn't matter. Take the ball when your team asks you to take the ball. He gave you two and a half weeks notice. I, I this again. This is typical Strowman. So the idea that he, uh, the home opener means more uh, because it's in Yankee Stadium than not, that, that's a load of nonsense. The, the so before before we, 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 we level more into Marcus Strowman, uh, and certainly, fortunately, we certainly don't have the time. We have another episode next week if we really want to get into it. But we do have to talk about spring training performances. And, and Corey Favs, I want to kick it over to you. Uh, back on the Mets side of the house, what I, what, what I asked of, uh, of, of my colleagues here, is if we could provide a player each uh, that we feel worries us most at this stage of spring training, as we are just 10 days, and I can't believe it, we're 10 days away from traditional opening day. But what player on your respect the team kind of worries you at this stage of spring training? Corey Faz, why don't you kick it off on the Mets side of the house? Yeah, I, I want to call out right now Starling Marte as well. And Starling Marte could really be the engine for a Mets lineup. He, the lineup is just different. It's deeper. It's more dynamic when you have Starling Marte playing well. And you look at 2022 when the Mets won 101 games. Marte was such a big part of that team, pretty much hitting in the two spot all year. Guy who got on base, stole a lot of bases, got some pop, a uh, great arm in right field. Uh, and then he got hurt in September. And what happened in September? The Mets started to fade off. They lost the division to the Braves. He came back for the playoffs, really wasn't healthy. They kind of forced him in there towards the bottom of the lineup. I think he hit sixth or seventh as opposed to his typical two spot. Just wasn't the same player. Last year, he was recovering from a groin injury all offseason. Never really recovered right. They brought him back. I don't think he was healthy, and he was dreadful last year. He actually got a little better later in the year. Got that average up to 248. It's, it's sad when you're saying get it up to 248, but that's just how bad he was looking. Uh, but all the reports this year was, oh, Marte is healthy. He's looking great. 
He was playing winter ball. Now, again, the pitching in winter ball, a good pitcher in winter ball is probably a bad picture in uh, Major League Baseball. You have a lot of guys towards the end of their career, some unknowns. Uh, I think Jerry's Familia was pitching to Marte in a couple of at-bats there. And he looked pretty good. He looked healthy. So right now, Marte looks healthy, but he's only hitting 143. He's only got a 200 on base percentage. OPS, my favorite stat to judge a player, 343. Uh, so not looking good right now. A lot of ground balls. Uh, and that's a problem with a lot of the Mets right now. A lot of ground balls. So I could already see it right now. You're going to have first and second, no out, and then a double play, uh, which is going to kill any any sort of rally there. So I'm happy that Marte's healthy. But until he really takes off, I would keep him at the bottom of the lineup. Don't jump him up to number two just yet. I love Stalling Marte as a player. I hope he succeeds. But I'm a little worried right now, especially because he actually looks healthy. Yeah, I mean, the the curious thing with Starla Marte is everybody was singing his praises. He was looking great in the Dominican League and all this stuff, and he just hasn't fired in the spring train. Now, again, usually in spring training, I don't overreact. The only people I worry about in spring training are young rookies and second-year players or guys coming off of injury. And in this case, Mar uh, 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 Marte's coming off of injury, so he he falls into that category where I start to worry about him. But at the end of the day, like, listen, if he's healthy, if he's running strong, if he's going to be there on the field and opening day, I got to trust that he's going to figure it out like a veteran would. Wants that. So um, as far as my guy is concerned, uh, I'm really worried about uh, Jeff McNeil, uh, basically because he hasn't played. Uh, Jeff McNeil hasn't played yet. He's got uh, bicep uh, soreness that's kept him out. He's supposed to, I believe, come back tomorrow or Wednesday, uh, and get his first uh, uh, action hidden. Um, so we're going to see there. But uh, again, another guy who had a down year last year, the Mets are relying on McNeil to be that jack of all trades, not only in the lineup, but in the field. He can play three, four, five positions if necessary. And, you know, that 270, you don't pay McNeil to hit 270. We pay McNeil to hit 310. And that's a big difference for a guy like him with who doesn't have the power. He has to have that high batting average to be uh, a maximum producer for the Mets. So for me, I, uh, he's the biggest concern just because he hasn't played yet, just because we're starting to run out of games here and he start, he has to get up to speed quick in order to make himself ready for opening day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. It's really the time right now. That's the biggest thing. Cause we just mentioned before, this is the last full week without New York Mets and New York Yankee baseball. I mean, they're going to be playing uh, 10 days from today. So uh, hopefully McNeil does have enough time. Uh, if not, they probably find a way to IL him or do something and keep him down there for an extra full week. Uh, I hope it doesn't come down to that, though. I hope he comes in, gets his at-bats, hits some nice line drive singles. Again, keep it simple. Like Joe said, this is a guy who wants hitting 300 to 325. I don't care if he's hitting 270 with 25 home runs. I'll take 325 and five home runs. I just want the guy to get on base, get singles, play small ball by moving runners over. That's what I want out of McNeil. Uh, I do hope he's healthy because last year was a bit of an off year. McNeil tends to have those years where one year really good, then he takes a step back. One year really good, step back. So if he does continue, uh, continue that trajectory, this will be a good year coming up. So uh, fingers crossed. I hope he's good to go, uh, but we shall see. Now, before I flip to the Yankees side of the house, again, the chat's been awesome. Uh, you guys with all these... <laughs> I'm trying to keep my laughter together here because you guys are just <laughs> way too funny. And I don't even know where to start with my uh, my shout-outs here. So I know I saw Dane first. So shout-out to my man, Dane Huber. Give him a follow at uh, – I think really, I, you got to help me out here with your personal. But it, it is Yankee uh, Yankees Farm on X. He does such a great job writing for Yankees Farm. I think it's DMH07. Yeah, you can put it in yourself, Dane. I don't know. Uh, we're going to shout-out to my guy, Ghost, of course. Give him a follow. Forever mm -hmm. one, Ghost. Uh, doing keeping it up with the spaces on X, we love seeing it, man. Great Yankees content. Uh, shout out to Joan. He sounds bitter. I guess she's talking about Joe. Um, Joe, Joe making a lot of friends today. Uh, Jack Esposito tuning in from X. Nestor will be fine on opening day. God, I only hope. Uh, let's see. There's so many comments here. I mean, you guys are fantastic. Let's see if I can pull up Keep one more. PG I Rich. Out yet. I think that's everybody, man. You guys are freaking killing it. You guys are freaking killing it. Uh, but yes, uh, and, and Dane with that that savage comment at the end. We're gonna keep that off the screen there. All right, let's flip to the Yankee side of the house. And Tom, who do you want to cover on the Yankee side? Who are you most worried about 
at this stage of spring training. I'm most worried about our opening day starter who, you know, we oh. already covered. That's Nestor Cortez. Um, Nestor, you can go back for now. Rich, this is what our fifth, is this our fifth year doing Yankee podcast going to this season? I right? believe so. Shout out to Pars. Yeah. So, you know, Nestor is someone that we both really like. Uh, Nestor's fun. There's no one more fun than Nestor when he's doing the leg kicks, the mustache, got the fun cleats. He, he's a good personality out there. Um, but there's just, it, it's, I, I'm concerned with him going into this year. Um, you know, he was a journeyman. He caught fire at the end of 2021. He was great in 2022. Last year was hurt. Um, you know, wasn't, wasn't very good. And, nope. and now what are we going to get with him this year? Extreme training stats. I don't care really that much about, uh, he's giving up a lot of hits. He is striking guys out. Um, which is, I guess, a, a positive thing, but I don't know. Like, there's, there, I don't think there's any way you can guarantee that Nesta Cortez is just going to be 2002 or 2022 Nesta Cortez again. Um, I would love for him to be because I, again, I love watching a pitch. He is one of my favorite Yankees, just like based on personality and all that kind of stuff. But I think it could be a big ass. Like, we now, I don't know. With Cole out too, it's just, it's, I think it could be a lot. Um, not because of opening day, but just because he might not, he might not, he might not have it. I, I don't know. Yeah. And, and with the Cortez too, we just want to see your guys' thoughts. And again, I don't watch every Nestor Cortez inning. I'd be lying if I said I did, but I know watching Cortez when he was really good two years ago. Uh, and a lot of what he used to do, you used to do those chooch motions and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. How much do you think the, uh, the pitch clock played a role last year? Maybe changed his approach maybe rushing cause an injury. Just want to hear your thoughts on the pitch clock uh, possibly being a, uh, a downside to Cortez. So that shouldn't matter because in 2022, he was actually one of the fastest pitchers um, like to, uh, from getting the ball to, to pitching it. So the quicker time in between pitches really shouldn't have affected him. He actually, I think he was one of the, the quickest guys on the mound. And when he starts all, if he does all the different motions, when he starts that, the clock ends anyway. Um, I think it could just be that the, the thing that scares me about Nestor is he's not a, a velo guy, right? He is, he, he pitches on the corners. He has good command, but when, when you only throw 92 and, and you kind of lose a little bit of command and that cutter just is hanging in the middle of the plate, that gets absolutely crushed in, in, in baseball nowadays. And, and that's what worries me playing in the ALEs, playing Yankee stadium is just, Throwing a, you know, a few of those a game, and then all of a sudden you're you're, you're giving up five six runs, and it's it's just, it's worrisome. It's worrisome. I hope I'm wrong because I love Nestor, but I'm worried. A couple comments here. Uh, my my guy Bojo, shout out to Bojo. Maybe Nestor's improvement was due to learning how to pitch and a learned cutter. Jack Esposito, I agree, but I hope he is back to Nestor from two years ago. Plus, throwing much harder than last year. I've gone to several spaces and uh, even this own pod and said that you know Nestor between 2021 and 2022 was the best statistical pitcher on the Yankees. And that's even with Garrett Cole and Hal. So, you know, getting Nestor back to even three quarters of that form would be crucial for this rotation. Uh, shout out to Sierra here. Uh, join, uh, we love, we love hyping up content creators here. So join the Yankees vibe X space every week, nine at 7 PM, a ton of enthusiastic fans and a ton of knowledgeable people, including rich, rich who I don't know what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Nestor Cortez. I, 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 I hope this is, uh, at least a year where Nestor can stay healthy. And, and if we could try to see if he can work through the pitch clock, I think I, I'm lead towards you, Tom. I, I, I don't think the pitch clock is affecting him, but I think when, I think the longevity we're going to see throughout the season, I think it's going to play into, Hey, is he truly being affected by this pitch clock, which I think is also being minimized even further this season. So be interesting to see what Nestor has in the tank. Uh, but we do miss uh, some, some quality Nestor. And I'm going to wrap things up with a player who did hit uh, the news today as of uh, a couple of hours ago, and that is DJ LeMahieu. And prior to the LeMahieu news, I was only going based off performance, but yeah, I'm now I'm literally worried because LeMahieu is questionable for opening day at this moment. Uh, they're saying the infielder fouled the ball off his right foot recently, and Boone said LeMahieu has a sig pretty significant bone bruise and won't be playing through it for the time being. With opening day now just over a week away, it's unclear if LeMahieu will be ready in time. So uh, just forget the stats. It's mm -hmm. now just the Yankees were going in with their projected leadoff hitter, who's now, I believe, at the age of 34 or 35, and the Yankees 
now don't have him in that spot. Now, I'll be honest with you guys. LeMayu hasn't, to, at least to me, I felt like hasn't earned that spot back in the order. He has no. not been that player for the last three seasons. And no. I know a lot of fans are going to be calling for Alex Verdugo. And Verdugo, I know, is struggling this spring, but he has led off for the Red Sox in the past. You know, my thing is I'm, you know, somewhat of uh, an OCD uh, guy with a lineup, and I like lefty, righty, lefty, righty, lefty. And the idea of possibly starting a lineup with two lefties, I don't know. This kind of bugs me a little bit. I, and I think Verdugo is perfect for the spot, but you need to have Soto bat second mm -hmm. before Judge in that lineup. So I don't know what you do there. So, uh, Tom, when, when you when LeMayu down and possibly missing opening day, who would you lead off with this uh, for the opening day lineup? Who would I lead off is a is a tricky one. Glaber led off a little bit last year, but I don't love Glaber in that spot. No. I like I like Glaber hitting further down. I guess it's for Dugo is, is the only one else I could Volpe is not ready for it. You mm -hmm. can't throw him into that leadoff spot at the start of the season. He needs to stay down in the lineup for as long as he possibly can and really build up that uh Oh, that confidence. He's, he's, I'm sorry, Volpe doesn't get on base nearly enough to be a leadoff hitter. He's at, the, he, he might end up being the Yankees leadoff hitter later this year or into the future. He's not good enough right now, not close to being good enough to be the Yankees leadoff hitter. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I kind of agree with you, Tom. I, I think it needs to be Verdugo. I thought it needs to be Verdugo anyway. Listen, I, I like DJ. DJ is one of my favorite Yankees. I love his style of play. But let's be real. DJ is on the wrong side of 35. He no, he no longer is looking like a player that can play every single day and is a guy who's going to start to need periodic rest. You're probably going to have to use him more as a guy that uh, moves around the diamond, plays three or four times a week, not five or six days a week, and to get the most out of him. Listen, the big thing about Verdugo and the big thing about the Yankees is the Yankees only have two guys who are good base runners on the entire team. Not that Judge isn't a good base runner, but he's not he's the greatest guy. Verdugo is one of the top base runners in the game. Even though he's not a base stealer, he is an excellent base runner. The Yankees need that, especially when they got Judge and and Torres and, and uh, Soto, guys who are pretty much mediocre to not good base runners behind them. Soto and, and, and Torres are very bad base runners and judge isn't as fleet of foot, especially with that toe injury. So for me, I think you need that mobility at the top of the order. Um, yeah. So I would go Verdugo, but yeah, I, I I'd be worried about DJ and I guess I, I want to see if the Yankees can move him into a, more of a rotational role than relying on, on him every single I think time. I think the Yankees' bigger question is, do they go out and sign someone to play third base? Because we don't know how long DJ will be out. This would have been the perfect opportunity for Peraza to step in. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, but Peraza's out now. So I, I guess you're starting Oswaldo at, at, at third, which I don't, I don't love either. Um, you know, there are some veterans out there. And I wonder if the Yankees go and try to sign a veteran and, you know, see what happens. If you, if you, if you cut them or, you know, DFA them in, in two, three weeks, you, you cut them or DFA them in three weeks, you know, if, if they weren't being picked up anywhere anyway. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I feel like you, you, they kind of have to address it. Cause if not, who, who you, you, I don't know. I don't like Oswaldo you know, Tom, being funny. the starter. I, 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 I didn't even think about that. I was more thinking about the positional lineup. But, yeah, the Yankees have a starting lineup, uh, starting roster spot they need to fill now because who's your third baseman? And it's unfortunate because if Oswald Peraza doesn't go down with his injury, that's your guy, and yeah. there's no yeah. debate. And, it's and he, he, and he could have just taken it from DJ. It, 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 he could have had the chance to just take it and, and take that job and be like, Boone, you can't get me out of this lineup if he was really going to you know, do well for the first two, three weeks. If that's all DJ's out for, we don't really know. Well, my, Mikey Pars has a hell of a suggestion. My guy, Michael Pars, the alley, friend of the show, friend of us. Go get Donaldson out of retirement <laughs> since you paid him I mean, $6 four... million dollars to shank balls oh, in retirement boy. anyway. I mean, so listen, really it's former get, MVP. Go with the panic oh, mode. Man. Oh, my God. I want yeah. every remnant from that Donaldson trade gone. I want Rortfett gone as well. But, no, the Yankees need a third baseman now. Uh, do they go your B-Boss on the roster? Uh, I mean, you really are working your way down the total, Paul. Who's going to be your starting third baseman if you stay internal? Yep. Um, if... I know there's a lot of – there's interest in Donovan Solano from the fans, at least, uh, who who did play quality. That would, that would be more of a, you know, a longer. If, too bad J.D. Davis still isn't out there. That would have been like. That, that actually, yeah. yeah, you remember the Oakland A's. 
I mean, I know the Yankees yeah. are worried about the lefty lefty with Verdugo and Soto. Why don't you just well, yeah. put Soto and Judge? I mean, then you got the lefty right. I mean, does it really matter? I, I'd that rather much start if Verdugo Judge Soto. hits in front of Soto or Soto hits in front of Judge. Soto's a better have- on base guy. You you want Soto in front of Judge. And I'll tell you what, you don't want so you, you want Judge too far down. Too, but I'll tell you, I would love Glaber two, Soto three, Judge four. Uh, I think they really get some good balance there. And uh, again, that that leaves the question: who's the leadoff hitter? And I would go Verdugo, and that does keep your lefty righty, lefty righty. Uh, I don't think they want to keep Judge that far down lineup. They're going to want him two or three. Uh, but that would give you lefty righty, lefty righty. And I saw a lot of old pay love in the chat. Uh, love, I, love. I would agree. Keep him down towards the, down the lineup for now. Different story. If all of a sudden it's June first, he's hitting three hundred, and you're constantly switching out guys hitting leadoff. Mm-hmm. Sure, go ahead and do it at that point of time. No need to uh, rush him right now. So they did last year, he, and it was a disaster. Correct. Exactly. Yeah, I think he could work himself into that. I, I I would keep him towards the bottom as well, and I'm a huge Anthony Volpe fan. I think it just makes the most sense to keep him there in a non pressure role. I think he's going to eventually earn that role. Uh, he's been killing it in spring. He had a four for four game the other day over the weekend. So I think, hey, keep him on that track and he will absolutely uh, adopt that lead off role sooner than we know it. I know my guy, Damian Serrano, to Joe's point, says we may have to see Judge at two and so at three. So that would have Verdugo at one. So you have your lefty, righty, lefty, righty. Uh, Sierra, even but just because you're wild. OCD about that doesn't mean like a, a, a you know, Boone and the Yankees have to be. I, I don't think you. You, if you want, if you want Soto in front of Judge because you think that's better for how those two will will work, I don't think then you you don't do that just because for Duke. Well, I guess you know what it is. You know what it is, Tom. I think I've been conditioned for over the last few years. The Yankees only having two guys back from the left side of the starting lineup. One of them being Anthony Rizzo, and the other one being Aaron Hicks on the switch hitting side. So now I'm not used to the fact that there are lefty options in their lineup. You still have Austin Wells. If your B boss is getting the starting third base job, there's another lefty in the lineup. As well, a switch now hitter is mostly hitting lefty. So you can possibly make it work. I still am not like the, the biggest fan of lefty lefty to start. Half the that. Yankees lineup is lefties right now. Sierra, Glaber Torres, Soto, Judge, Rizzo, Stanton, Verdugo, that's, Volpe, Wells, Cabrera. That could be, I mean, that's a that. really slow. That's an ex- that might be the slowest start in six in a lineup I've ever seen. That 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 is base to base at every um, balls hit to to Minnesota. <laughs> That's the only problem with that one. Uh, in yeah, my mind, try to get Chipper Jones out of retirement. All right, well we're we're believing here, but yeah, they need a third base spot to fill. They need a leadoff spot to fill, and and with ten days to go until until uh, opening day, it'll be interesting to see how the Yankees fulfill those roles. Now we have a lot of love again in the mm-hmm. chat, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. We have sixty people in the build building. So if you can, give us that digital thumbs up, that like on our YouTube page. Send that YouTube page out to your friends and family, whoever's into Need baseball. Even if you don't like baseball, let's convert some fans into baseball fans tonight. Yeah, so bring them on over here as we're moving up our, our way from, from 60 fans here. But Thomas, I know before we get into our big segment of predictions, you have some cool words on our friends over at Roback. So let's talk Roback. Let's talk Roback. And uh, last week when I was uh, down in, in Clearwater, I, I was telling everyone that if you, especially if you are a golf fan, which I'm sure some of you out there, you know, might be, um, that Roback will be coming out with a, a master's themed collection soon. Well, that happened. Uh, the collection has started to come out. I'm, I'm wearing one of them from last year. It's available this year. It's the Azalea collection. Fresh. It is. Listen, if you, if you like golf, there's nothing better than the master's second week. Of, uh, of April every year, I'll tell you. Florida Yankees play on that Sunday. I won't care what happens because uh, I'll be watching the Masters. Um, but listen, Roback is is out there making the best polos, Q-zips, hoodies, even if you're not a golfer. The, the Q-zips, the hoodies, uh, they make a lot of the workout stuff. Shorts, they make great stuff for, for women too. I got some, got some stuff for my wife for Christmas this year. She loves it. She was wearing it this weekend. Head over to Roback.com. Uh, he used promo code TWASPL15. That works on all the, the Masters, the Azalea collection. Uh, it gives you 15% off your first order as long as you're using a new email address. Uh, get at Roback.com, promo code TWASPL15 to get yourself 15% off of your first order. You heard it from the man himself. Todd, what are those? Are those like cherry blossoms? Like, that's, that's, they're Azaleas. They're Azaleas. They're Azaleas. Azaleas. Yeah. All right. Richard, Rich, Rich, what, what, you got to yeah. come over to watch the Masters with me and Tom. You got, you got. No, I don't. 
it, it, it is the most gorgeous. The it's the most artificially gorgeous Absolutely. place that Absolutely has not. ever been oh. made. No freaking way. No freaking way. I, I'd rather watch paint dry. I, I'd rather watch just about anything else than boring old golf. Actually, oh. I'd rather watch NASCAR than golf. That's how, that's we can, how we can arrange that too. Me and Corey going to a NASCAR race up in Pocono this year again. Oh, what's fun? So we can arrange that too. But listen, we, we got Instagram also. Uh, so I'll go right into that. You can follow us on Instagram at Empire State of Baseball. You can follow each of us, uh, Corey at Corey Faz, myself at JR Pugs, Rich at Rich J. Rivera, and Tom at T. Waspel. Uh, for all our content on our Instagram, Corey does a great job with our reels and our memes and all this stuff. Rich does a good job posting our content that we cover on the show uh, is posted over on Instagram for everybody of you. We have our top 10 uh, right now lists coming out exclusively on YouTube, but the oh. graphics will also be up on YouTube on uh, Instagram uh, as we get closer to that. So we'll go into the next segment. Now. All right, Joe, thank you so much for that. Uh, let's get the people what they want and what they want to hear our 2024 MLB full season predictions. Uh, we're, it's it's way too early, possibly, to reveal all these predictions, but mm -hmm. we're going to get right into it. The MVPs, the Saw Youngs, the Rookie of the Years, the World Series, and we have a bold prediction that each of us have to share with you. So we're going to start off with the MVP side of the house. And uh, Corey Faz, why don't you run down what the MVPs we got up here? Yeah, so right now we have three MVPs. So you have both myself and Tom going with Jordan Alvarez. I know that's probably going to upset uh, a lot of the Yankee fans in the chat. Uh, Joe going with Julio Rodriguez and Rich going with Juan Soto. I'll tell you what, though, Rich, I was very close with going Soto, too. And so, yeah, I was really debating it back and forth between Soto and Alvarez. Uh, and, and I just gave the, the nod here to Alvarez. I think this year is going to be the year for him, too. Uh, and I mentioned it before, OPS. That is my favorite stat. And if you want to know which player that Fangrass is projecting to have the highest OPS, uh, mm -hmm. it is Mr. Jordan Alvarez. So I'm going to give the nod to Alvarez and the Astros this year to go ahead and get that MVP. And Tom, I want to hear your side, too, because you're right there with me on that projection. Yeah, I think Jordan, who has been an absolute terror uh, to pitchers for the last few years, is going to step it up to a different level this year. Um, but before the show, I was I was saying to the guys, I think he's going to have a David Ortiz style MVP season. And then I realized David Ortiz never won an MVP. How he didn't win it in two thousand? If the Jeter not winning two thousand six. Ortiz was 30 at 54 homers, 100, uh, 137 RBIs, and a, over a one dot OPS for the season. It is why the Justin Morneau won that MVP. Uh, I think Yodon Alvarez is going to hit 50. I think he is going to really, as this Astros team starts to transition, you know, away with Bregman possibly leaving, Altuve getting older. You know, you got Tucker there, but I think Yordan is going to really establish himself even more as as the big bad in the al you know with judge um you know hopefully soto for a long time too yeah uh, listen i i like i like Jordan pick as well uh look i'm going with my guy julio rodriguez listen this guy's going to win an mvp soon um silver slugger you know, has the ability uh, uh, to to win a gold glove if he improves his field in a little bit. He's going to – he can be a 40-40 guy. I mean, he had a year that that didn't progress as much as we thought coming off his rookie year, and he still had 32 home runs, 37 stolen bases, hit 275. If he can just take those stats to the next tick up, if he can produce a 40-40 season, if he can hit 290 – with a 370 OP, uh, OPS uh, on base percentage, this this guy's going to be a perennial MVP, not just a one time uh, thing. So, uh, all three of these guys have the talent to win it. I'm just going Julio because I think he brings the most diversity in the stats, and therefore you can have a more dominant season when you're stealing bags as well as hitting balls out of the yard. Joe, I think you have a new best friend in Boogie, man. I feel like you and Boogie. Uh, I know, me and Boogie got a chat, man. I think, Boogie, well, I think Boogie's a double agent uh, on the Mets <laughs> side of the house, infiltrating the Yankees with that Don Mattingly photo. But uh, but yeah, and I got Juan Soto, of course. I got to give love to Soto. And, and I'm going to keep it simple. Yankee Stadium for a lefty, contract season. That is all. He's going to he's gonna absolutely explode for the Yankees. It's going to be quite the race between him and Judge. After, hopefully, hopefully, Judge is coming into to the season healthy. Obviously, that's another note that we can get into. But uh, Soto is going to have a monster year uh, for the New York Yankees in Yankee Stadium. And a lot of love for Soto here in our chat. 
Uh, one guy I want to call out because I want to call out some oddballs here in, in our chat here. SJ83 says ALVP Bobby Witt Jr. And that is a great pick. And that's the guy mm -hmm. who I think is on the verge of having a massive season uh, for the Kansas City Royals. Actually, I, I'll tell you right now, Kansas City Royals, my pick to win the AL Central. We're not doing the full standings on today's show, but that, that's my pick. And I think Bobby Witt's going to be a main reason because of it. All right. Let's move on to the National League side of the house. And Joe, what? let's touch on the National League. What do we got here? Yeah, so National League MVP, uh, Rich and Tom have Ronald Cunha Jr. Uh, I have Corbin Carroll, last year's Rookie of the Year. And Corey went with Shohei Otani making the move over, but not pitching this year. So he's going to have to do it all with the bat. Um, but I'll start out with my pick, Corbin Carroll. Listen, again, another guy kind of like Julio Rodriguez can do it all. Had an unbelievably massive rookie breakout season for the Diamondbacks last year. Was one of the main reasons they got to the World Series. This guy is phenomenal. 25 home runs, 10 triples, 54 stolen bases last year. Um, and, and this guy, uh, he's in the same category as Julio Rodriguez. He can do it all, and he's going to be an absolute unbelievable player to watch in the next few years. So that's my pick this year. Now, who does all yeah. those things better? Ronald Acuna Jr. And he's on a better team, and he's going to go up against the lights of Jose Quintana and the Mets' trash rotation. <laughs> Ronald Acuna Jr. last year was incredible. And uh, I think he's going to keep it going. I think this Braves team is going to have a chip on their shoulders from how, how last year finished. And I think Acuna is going to lead them. Uh, we'll get into where later. Uh, but Rich, let's talk a little bit more about uh, Acuna here. Oh, yeah. I mean, Ronald Acuna, if you guys remember last year, for, for the OGs who were here for last year's prediction show, uh, the, the, the three co-hosts, uh, my three colleagues here, all thought Manny Machado was going to have the NL MVP for 2023. And I was the only one, the only one on the show to vote for Ronald Acuna Jr. And he certainly went off and won it. I'll go out and say, and obviously I'm going to back him up for a second year in a row. I will go out and say, and this is going to be a take, and I might get killed here. I think Ronald Acuna Jr. is the best player in baseball. I think he's the best all-around player yeah. in the game today. Mm -hmm. He does it all, and I know he doesn't pitch like Otani pitches, but Acuna is a master class of a player. Last year was a massive year for him in 2023. And I, I look, I'm, I'm going to see that he's going to continue this into 2024. But, but Corey Favs, uh, more on Shoei Otani, uh, one of the, the prized possessions of the offseason for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Yeah, and, and Otani was the face of baseball when he was playing for the Angels. All of a sudden, now you're going to make that move right across town to uh, the Dodgers. And it's just going to be even more so with the Dodgers on paper being the best team in the league. Again, whether or not they actually run the distance is a completely different conversation because we do know uh, they tend to choke a little bit in the playoffs. But uh, again, whole different conversation. But Shohei Otani, I don't care if he's not even pitching. I still trust him to go out there and potentially win an MVP. You look at his numbers last year in the American League, 44 home runs that led the American League. OPS over 1.0. Again, OPS, my favorite stat he led that category last year in the American League. And I just think he's coming to a Dodgers team that's a lot better than the Angels were. Uh, I think he is the absolute face of baseball, the hottest name in the business. There's a little bit of bias he too when it comes to the awards. So I think Shohei Otani is going to be the NL MVP this season. And again, season. I just want to look through some of the some of the guys here suggested in the chat. Uh, Freddie Freeman, who landed on our on our top list of first base when we did release that episode, our, our best ranking top 10 ESB player rankings. I have more details on that, but Freddie Freeman was our number one first baseman. Uh, Joey Bag of Donuts has him winning the NL MVP. SJ83, he's in between uh, Joe's pick and Corbin Carroll, or even Fernando Tatis Jr. Uh, having a big year. Uh, he's also coming off a solid season himself, so that is definitely uh, not one that, uh, that I can argue there. Jack Esposito goes Bryce Harper, having a monster year, so... Yep. Uh, again, Harper, uh, always going to be in the conversation. So that's a great pick. And uh, we got Bojo here. Watch out for Mookie for MVP. Great protection. I think the, I mean, the, the Dodgers, the, the Dodgers, the Dodgers have, they're going to, they're also going to cannibalize themselves. If the Dodgers are that good, it's going to be like, who's, who gets the votes. And that's why I think, you know, the, the Braves have a lot of good guys too. I think it, it you know, right. Acuna is clearly the guy there. The, the, the Dodgers have so much going on. When right. you're I mean, on great, 
when you're on great teams, you need to have that special. Like you need yeah. to do what Acuna did last year, because Austin Riley and 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 Olson are are just as valuable to that team. So you need to have that special year with the Dodgers and Otani. It's going to be hard for the three players. They're so great. They're they're supposed to win 110 games. So everybody's valuable on that team. That's why I go for guys like Carroll and Julio because they really they make such a huge difference to their franchise. Whereas, like, if Otani misses 15 games, the Dodgers are going to win 95 games no matter what. Um, so, like, that that's why I go with those kind of picks instead. So, Joe had Julio for, for MVP, and we're going to continue with the Seattle love on the American League side of the house. And, Tom, mm -hmm. uh, let, let's touch on these three uh, candidates here for the American League Cy Young. Yeah, so I just continue to to back up one of my co-hosts in, in every uh, every every one, one of our selections the here. best one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna say Luis Castillo. He's a guy who I, almost I feel like a little forgotten. Uh, he was so good with the Reds. Moved over to Seattle. has has been good. Not like he's been bad, but I feel like he's he doesn't get quite the love that I, I think he he can deserve. And um, I could just see him. I see the Mariners being a team to really help you know, continue to break out this year. You know, battle the Astros for for the division, if not get that wild card. And I think Castillo could be the guy who really you know pushes them over on the pitching side. And it's a little bit – it's it's kind of pain thinking how close Castillo could have been a Yankee about a couple of seasons ago. But obviously, the Yankees decided to retain their their shortstop uh, capital, and Castillo remains a Mariner, and I think this year is going to be his AL Cy Young year. Uh, but, Joe, I think it's a perfect transition to you because you have Castillo's mm -hmm. teammate here. Yeah, I have George Kirby. And, listen, you look at, at any uh, Seattle Twitter, reporters, writers, all that, they, they don't – go enough into how much they love George Kirby over there. Uh, 3.35 ERA last year, 190 innings pitch, 172 strikeouts. Most important stat, though, 19 walks in 190 innings. I mean, that's that's DeGrom-like, uh, the, the amount of control he had. Led the league with strikeouts per walk in 9.05. Uh, this is a control plus plus pitcher. This is a guy who controls every side of the plate. He's young. He's going to be in that rotation for years, 25, 26 years old. And he really, he, to me, he's the next great AL pitcher. I think that's going to be a, a, a force for the next few years. So I got him for the Cy Young. Yeah. And mine with Framber Valdez. And again, I'm not trying to pick all of the Astros right now. Cause I almost went back with Garrett Cole. Cause again, I was thinking of this list just about a month ago and saying, all right, who do I think is going to be my prediction picks this year? And I almost went back to back with Cole. Uh, and the reason I went with Cole last year is the same exact reason why I'm going with Valdez this year. Cause I want a guy that I could rely on to give me just about 200 innings to give me a quality start, just about every game. And when you want to talk about quality starts, I mean, it was just two years ago in 2022, that Valdez had, what, 25 straight quality starts. Uh, great, solid pitcher. Again, Castillo and Kirby are phenomenal names. I could easily see both of these guys winning the Cy Young Award. I just want to trust the guy who I think is going to give me a quality start just about all of the 30-plus games he's going to pitch for me, and that's my reasoning for going Valdez. I said it last year with Cole, and I think the same thing with Valdez this year. Rich, you're on mute. Still on mute. Still on mute, Rich. He doesn't realize it. Oh, I'm on mute. Not the, <laughs> not the yeah. old school Zoom conversation in 2020. Oh, you're on mute. Take yourself off mute. But Sierra, what I was saying was my buddy Sierra here buried this comment early on. I didn't want to forget it, but her Cy Young pick, uh, at least for the American League side, is Clark Schmidt. Uh, <laughs> Sierra uh, is a huge Clark Schmidt supporter. I do have to preface that. And a huge Dylan Cease performer. So we'll get into the National League side of the house in a little bit. But uh, some more American League picks. Uh, Swift with uh, with Corbin Burns. Uh, Bojo here. Corbin Burns. Also a great pick. I mean, Corbin Burns absolutely was so somebody I did consider uh, for the Baltimore Orioles being the head man over in uh, Baltimore. And yes, of course, a lot of love for, for Mr. Clark Schmidt. Uh, but uh, let's keep it moving uh, to, the, to the National League, Cy Young. And uh, I'll, I'll take this one. And this is crazy again, because I would understand like cross ups on certain players. I can understand Acuna in a way, Castillo. But the fact that me, Joe and Tom all had Zach Wheeler, I thought was kind of crazy. But but Thomas, 
you want to touch more on Mr. Zach Wheeler? Yeah. So I, um, I realized the other day that I, in my possession have a Zach Wheeler uh, rookie card that's autographed and I'm just kind of investing in, in this pick that he wins the Cy Young and I could flip that um, for some cash. So that's a true story. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Listen, uh, Wheeler signed the big extension. Uh, he's always kind of danced around in 2021. He finished second in the Cy Young last year. He finished uh, sixth with a gold glove. Um, and he's a guy who's kind of found himself, found that consistency where he's going to be in this race, in this conversation every year. You know, he's a high strikeout guy, led the league in 2021 with 247, led, uh, had 212 last year in terms of strikeouts. He is a phenomenal pitcher. I think he's going to break through and get it. Spencer Strider is obviously a, a big plus, and Corey's probably going to talk about his pick. But I think Wheeler, I think Wheeler is going to get one before his time is done. Um, and I think this is the year that he's going to do it off that big extension. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, with Spencer Strider too, I mean, the guy right now is looking scary good. And Zach Wheeler, again, great pitcher. I could definitely see him winning a Cy Young as well. But Spencer Strider, I mean, he was a great pitcher to begin with. This spring, he worked on a curveball, and now he's introducing the curveball into games too. And right now, I mean, you want to talk about all qualified pitchers. Again, spring training, you want to take it a little bit with a grain of salt. But this is just a crazy stat right now. In spring training of all qualified pitchers, and it doesn't take too much to be qualified in spring training, he is the only qualified pitcher with a zero earned run average right now, Spencer wow. Strider. I think he's scary. He had a great outing the other day and called it sloppy. And that also oh. reminds me of Prime oh. DeGrom, like when he would get a couple guys on base, still give up no runs to say, I didn't have my best stuff today. I think Spencer Strider is going to have a big year, and he is going to be a big problem for the National League. Her hurts me to think I just gave up Spencer Strider to Joe in our fantasy league as, as essentially compensation, and uh, now he's just kicking my ass on the other side. That's okay. Corey uh, gave me Cor Corbin Carroll for nothing. Yeah, so yeah. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. true. That is yep. true. Uh, well, a couple of uh, uh, there are a couple takes here, and I said whoa and double whoa in the chat because uh, first I saw Chris Sale in there, and now Chris Sale again, if he wins Cy Young, he's also winning Comeback Player of the Year because you would need to find that Chris Sale back from those 2018 Red Sox days to really put in that kind of work for NL side. And I'll tell you what, what a scary thought. If he ever finds it for Atlanta and it's him, Strider, and Freed leading that rotation for the Braves, oh, that's the best rotation in baseball. Oh, boy. Easily. So that, that's a scary thought. And my guy Swift, is Alexis Diaz a crazy take? I mean, considering that relief pitch, yes. like, like just oh, yes, it is. the love. It is. Yeah, I, it's a crazy take. <laughs> it's it a is. crazy take. If that's Edwin didn't win let's, let's in 2022, uh, Alexis enough. won't win it this year. All righty. Well, let's move on then to the American League Rookie of the Year and Corey Fass, who are we touching on? I'll tell you what, there's a lot of talk in Texas and whether it's Evan Carter or Wyatt Langford. And I'll tell you right now, Wyatt Langford, the biggest thing with him was, was he going to make the team out of spring training? If he did not make the Texas Rangers, I, I don't know what other way to describe it other than absolutely disastrous. Because right now, Wyatt Langford... He looks like one of the best hitters in baseball. Forget about being a rookie. Uh, right now in spring training, I just mentioned before with Spencer Strider and how great he's been. Wyatt Langford's just as good on the other side of the house. He leads all qualified hitters in spring training in OPS. He has five home runs. He has 17 RBIs in just 16 games. Nice. And again, these 16 games, he's not playing a full uh, four or five at-bat day. He's getting an at-bat here, maybe two at-bats here, three at-bats there. He has 17 RBIs in just 16 games. Uh, I really like Wyatt Langford. Him and Evan Carter, what a nice duo you have for that Texas Rangers team. As long as they found a spot for Langford, and it looks like they are going to have a spot for him. Uh, I mean, I just really like the excitement going into this season. Tom, get out of my head. I told you, I just like to support, I like to support my uh, my fellow uh, pod mates here. Um, listen, Evan Carter uh, played in what uh, a handful, twenty three games last year, and, and did rake. Um, mm -hmm. He still was qualified as a rookie, and I'm just gonna go with just having a little bit more of that experience over Langford um, to to get him. But again, it could be a situation where they might cannibalize votes, and then and then it could uh, go to someone else. But I think Carter was so good last year in limited time. I think he can continue that this year. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and it's crazy. Like when you win a World Series, like it, the, the question that becomes like, how do you improve your team after reaching the pinnacle of Major League Baseball? And Texas didn't have a sexy offseason, but what they're going to add to this team are two guys internally that are going to pump up their already crazy offense in Evan Carter and Wyatt Lankford. So uh, it's going to be more exciting days co to come for the Texas Rangers with those two picks. But Joe, of course, uh, taking the Tampa Bay's star shortstop uh, mm -hmm. and one we can actually talk about on the show. So Joe, let's go. What do we got here? Yeah, the, I, I'm taking Caminario here from the Rays, the number four prospect according to MLB. Uh, dot com uh, in baseball. Evan Carr is actually five and Langford's actually six. So we did four, five, six there. But oh, uh, right. the biggest thing about Caminario is he, the power is rated as 70 out of 80. He hit 31 home runs last year in the minor leagues in 117 games. He is absolute stud. He has real power. And not just the power to be a 30 run, home run hitter. He has the power to be a 40 plus home run hitter. And the Rays are going to have him in the heart of their order by the uh, by the all-star break, I think. Um, and I think he's going to show that off in a big way. I think he's going to be the rookie of the year in the AL this year. So Swift and, and, and real LID 50 call out Jackson Holiday as the outlier here. And Jack Esposito throwing it out to Matt Holiday. Uh, the, the daddy of, of all Jackson. Jackson obviously is going to make an argument too. It'd be interesting if he's going to grab a starting infield job from opening day, but yet you can't go wrong with the number one all, overall prospect in, in baseball. All righty. Next we have the national league rookie of the year and uh, Joe let's, let's touch on the NL rookie of the year. What we got? Yeah. I wish I could be unoriginal uh, here, but, and Rich and Tom are on the same boat as me. Uh, we're going with uh, Yosh Yoshinobu Yamama Yamamoto uh, of the Dodgers. Corey is going to have the different take here in Kyle Harrison, but uh, Yamamoto is, is signed a $300 million deal in the off season, comes over from Japan. Yes, I know professional ball player coming from another professional league probably should debate the eligibility of being rookie or not. Um, but the, the, the safe money is on Yamamoto. Um, the Dodgers are relying on him to anchor the top of that rotation. Um, and we're going to see uh, what he's got. We've gotten a couple previews in spring training, and he's got some crazy movement on some of his pitches. Um, so we're going to see how that goes. But I think he's going to it's going to be hard to beat him out for rookie of the year uh, just for given the expectations for him. Well, Joe, I think Corey I forgot that Yamamoto signed. Like, he maybe is <laughs> just so I heartbroken that he wasn't a Met because – Yamamoto, I'd have to look. He has to almost be like minus odds to win the the you NL know, Rookie of the Year at this point. I'm gonna I'm gonna look at it right now. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, Joe. Actually, to your point, I wanted to piggyback off the uh, the Rookie of the Year argument when it comes to uh you know a Japanese um import. You know, I I think I'd almost want to bang the, the wave the flag for renaming the award from Rookie of the Year to First Player of the Year. A first year player that is. I think that actually might make more sense because yeah, Yamamoto's got leagues years of big league experience on the other side of the map so uh I, I think i'd be into renaming the award in that case but you know in the chat we do have love for jackson churro but Corey favs has love for kyle harrison let's hear more about kyle harrison from Corey favs yeah I, what i like about kyle harrison coming to this year too is he already has a taste of major league baseball in that nl west absolutely stacked division with the dodgers who i just think are going to be the best team in the National League, at least record-wise. I don't think they run the table. Uh, more to come on that in our next uh, prediction coming up. Uh, but I like the fact that he does have seven starts under his belt. Uh, he's looking pretty good in spring training. The thing with Kyle Harrison, as long as he can contain the walks, he could really be a good force there. I was thinking about Yamamoto, too. Uh, but if it's, if, it's, if it's the clear-cut guy... It's not always the clear cut guy. Then why isn't every single person betting Yamamoto and losing the sports book money? There's always something that's going to happen. I almost had a hot take for our bold prediction, which will be one of our, again, one of our predictions coming up. I was almost going to have a bold prediction that in July we're having Yamamoto bus talks already. Again, not saying Yamamoto is going to have a busted oh, year, but I could already see like a couple of months in numbers won't be sexy. Maybe a four ERA with high strikeouts. But a four ERA, people saying, is he worth all that money? I think when it's all said and done, Yamamoto has a great career. Don't get me wrong. 
but I like Kyle Harrison having already pitched seven games in that absolutely stacked division. All right. So we have two more sets of predictions to go, and this is a big one. It is, of course, the World Series winner and opponent. And Tom, uh, wrap it around. What do we got here? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I've been talking about the, uh, the Braves uh, a few times this episode, and I think that they seem like a team other different than the Dodgers. The Dodgers to me almost seem like okay with losing, like, ah, whatever. We, we lost the NLDS this year again. The Braves just, to me, it just feels like they, they kind of are going to take that from, from last year and be super motivated this year. And they're not going to let it slip away. Uh, I have them going back to the world series and I have them beating the Astros. I think until someone, the Astros are still just the, the big bad in, in the AL. And I hope the Astros don't make the, the world series because I hate them. Um, but until, until like they are just, just dead and gone. I'm just, I, I can't, I can't pick against them anymore. Well, look at that. I mean, everybody has the Braves involved in their World mm-hmm. Series. And it's actually the, the involvement of only three teams this year. Last year was kind of all over the map with the predictions. But Braves, Astros, and Mariners are going to be involved in the World Series across these, uh, you know, across these votes. Of course, I'm right there with you, Tom. I think the Braves have a lot. Uh, uh, the Braves are going to come off losing so early in that 2023 uh, postseason and, and make a statement early. And I think, again, you're going to see another similar kind of year for Atlanta, but this time they're going to capitalize in the playoffs. So uh big year to come for the Braves. But of course I look on the other side and we have a couple AL West teams and Corey Favs uh, has the Seattle Mariners uh, achieving greatness here with such no, a, great I do. a young talent. Joe does. Corey has the Astros. Oh, my apologies. Yes. 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 Uh, no, Corey listen, has- I, I, I love the Mariners. I love what they've done. Look look at their pitching staff. Their pitching staff, their top three is Luis Castillo, George Kirby, Logan Gilbert. I mean, that might be the best three-headed monster in the entire AL. There's the the Rangers rotations beat up. Astros rotations beat up. Uh, you know, for pitch for pitch, are you going to any other team in, in, in the league to get a better start in rotation? I think the answer is no. And they're filled with young talent. I, I, I love Julio. I think he's he's a monster. Uh, I, I think they're ready to take that next step and be that perennial. I think they're ready to take over for the Astros in, in that division and say, hey, we're the team to beat going forward, not the Astros anymore. Um, and I think they start this year with that rotation. But yeah. them taking that next step, I mean, they they, they have to start making the playoffs. So uh, that, that's their next step to be a perennial playoff team. Uh, to, to go from a team that maybe squeaks in as a wild card to make the World Series, I think, is They're freaking wild. Talented, and ridiculous. Though, Tom. They were talented last year. It didn't matter. The best in the game. They, they, they were the they, same they might have the last best year. Rotation. What, what happened last year with that? It didn't work out. Listen, if it was a, if it was another day of the season, it was very possible that the mm-hmm. Seattle Mariners were going to jump the Texas Rangers in that playoff, and it would have changed the course of history. So uh, it really tells you that sometimes it takes maybe one more game to change the course of, of history. So Corey Favs, let me get it right this time. Sorry about that, Joe. Joe had <laughs> the Mariners. Corey had the Houston Astros putting the dagger in Yankee fans' hearts once again with the Astros uh, taking the title. Yeah, I just want to call out first, too, that this is the second year in a row. Me and Tom actually have the same two teams. We just have yeah. the uh, the swap of the uh, the winner and loser there. So, listen, yep. until the Astros go out there and miss the playoffs or have a really bad playoff series, I just can't discount them. And the Seattle Mariners, listen, a really exciting team. Texas Rangers, we just raved about how great they are. Uh, I actually do think the ALCS will be a repeat of last year with the Battle of Texas. I just think the Astros this year, uh, I'm going to give them the edge in a seven-game set now over the Rangers. I think it swaps this year. Uh, The Astros just have that clutch factor. And we were talking about on a few of the shows, that clutch factor. And we talked about, if you listen to our first base rankings, we talked about Bryce Harper and how clutch he is at the plate. I mean, Altuve is just as clutch, probably more just considering how much that the Astros have won in recent years. The Phillies just starting to get there now with this uh, this particular team. Uh, so until they prove me wrong and have an upsetting season or get absolutely killed in a playoff set, I just can't discount the Astros right now. I did have a, a, a AL MVP and Cy Young on their team. I'm going with that high-level talent 
to continue to the playoffs. And that's why I have the Astros over the Braves, who, again, I mentioned the Dodgers, I think, are the best team with in terms of record in the regular season. But I think the Braves best them in the playoffs. All right. So the last one is a fun one. So I always ask, what is the bowl prediction of, of each of the hosts here? And uh, it can get a little wild. And, and this one, there's some the wild say, one. Some, some might say stupid. So. All right. Well, you know what? Instead of me breaking them all down at once, I'm going to start with the guys that somehow, some way, have the same bowl prediction. And that's Tom and Joe having the believe that. Tigers win the AL Central. Mm-hmm. Explain yourself, boys. Listen, yeah, I like to support. I like to support the guys on my pod. Um, you can start with this, Joe. Yeah, listen, I mean, the Tigers are an up and coming team and it basically comes down to they have a lot of talent that is ready to break out. Spencer Torkelson had a down year as rookie year. We forget that this guy's only 24 years old. He had 31 home runs last year. I two yeah, he bet 233, but I think he's ready to go to that next step, which is starting to add average and OBP to that. They got Riley Green, hopefully uh healthy this year. They got uh uh Parker Meadows and Colt Keith coming up. Uh who knows what Javi Baez, whether or not he's gonna be that bad. And listen, their rotation's not terrible. I mean, they got Tyreek Scoobel, Jack Flaherty, and Kenta Maeda uh, uh had down years last year. Look for them to have a decent season. Matt Manning, uh, Reese Olsen. They got and Wilmer Flores, believe it or not, related to Wilmer Flores, whose father is also Wilmer Flores. Oh, Don't wow. get me started with that. That's all true. So they got a lot <laughs> of young talent coming up, and I think in a, an extremely winnable division, uh, they have a chance to win. Yeah, I mean, listen, someone has to win the AL Central. Why not the Tigers? That, that was my thought. It's yeah. like, listen, someone someone has to win this division. All these teams stink. But the Tigers, I agree. They they are up and coming. Um, you have uh, Miguel Cabrera gone now. And not that that's a, necessarily a positive, but I think it, it will also allow some of the younger guys to really come into their own and be the guy or the guys, the leaders on that team. And I could see them taking – Taking that, uh, take advantage of that and, and win the division. And they have right. Gio Urshela. And they have yeah. Gio Urshela. Oh, that would be a heartbreaker if he won with them. <laughs> and, uh, the Yankees are sitting on the sidelines. And Corey Faz, do, he brings it back to New York. I love that Corey brought it back to the New York side of the house. Got the Mets finishing top 10 in ERA. And, and I honestly cannot believe I'm saying this because if this was about three or four weeks ago, I would have said I'm having some Henny while I'm doing the show and making my predictions. But I'll tell you what, the Mets pitching actually looks pretty good. And we talked about it last week, how the Mets were not, I mean, we're not talking about a fraction of a run, like like 0.2 or 0.4. The Mets, when we did the show last year, were a full earned run above the second place team in spring ERA. I mean, the Mets pitchers coming out looking controlled. They're looking disciplined. I love to see it. And if it wasn't for this weekend, I think it was yesterday, they had a split squad. uh, And in both games, they gave up a combined 15. So that kind of threw a damper on it. They're still 0.7 over the second place team in ERA. Uh, I think Tyler McGill this year has a breakout year. I actually think he gets uh, a little bit of an all-star conversation. Not saying he's going to be an all-star. But I think Tyler McGill has a chance to be the Mets' best pitcher from start to finish this year. Kodai Sanga is the best pitcher on the team, but we know he's going to miss probably about six weeks of the season. I think Tyler McGill has a breakout year. Quintana, again, Quintana is going to give you probably an ERA right around 3.8 or 4.0. He had, what, a 3.7 last year. I forget the exact number there. Uh, Edwin Diaz is coming back. I mean, he looks just as good as he was before he hurt that ACL in the World Baseball Classic last year. So uh, I will tell you what, I think the Mets pitching staff really surprises this year. I think we see a couple of the kids later in the season come up, whether it's due to injury or someone struggles, come up and do a fine job. I think the Mets will surprise. Well, Top 10 in, in the NL. In, yeah, oh, no, in MLB. I, I uh, Listen, Corey, I love you. I love the Mets. I, I think you're high as a kite. Yeah, I mean, listen, if, if Rich didn't have the most ridiculous, ludicrous, is- dumb, bold prediction, I would I would be yelling at you, Corey, but I just I have to save some air in my lungs 
to yell at Rich for the so let's, let's put it this way. Joe and I gave reasons why we think the Tigers will win the AL Central. Corey, although I don't agree with him, gave some pretty good reasons that the Mets pitching look good in spring training and they can carry that into this in, into the regular season. Rich, what are the the predictors out there that are making you feel or predict that there will be a walk off to clinch the World Series? I, I'm just curious. What's the you know what are the trends? What are the trends saying for that? It was a great show tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, we are going to move on, though, to the uh, upcoming schedule. No, guys, listen. I, I understand. It's a I guess. Understand. I don't it, think it, you do. But you know what? This is as bold as it gets because guess what? I, I had the Braves winning the World Series, and we haven't seen a walk-off home run to win a World Series since 1993 with Joe Carter against the Phillies off of Mitch Williams. But I can tell you right now, if Ozzy Albies hits a walk-off home run in Game 7 of the World Series, Everybody's going to say Rich is a wizard. Rich is no, a wizard. Just gonna say no, they're going to say, say that it was the most it. random thing in the world. No, no you didn't. There's no, like, I saw, like, if the Tigers win the Central, you can go back to look at this episode and say, Joe saw something in the Tigers that other people didn't see, and it was based on fact. This Rick, is Rick, this Rick, is random. This Rick, is Rick like I'm getting that, a bug in my hot dog, that, random. Oh. Rich knows that Ryan Presley is going to be is going to be going out there for his third inning of work, and Ozzy Albies has some good splits against them, and that's how he's going to hit a walk off to win the World Series. But, but I'll tell you what, though. ludicrous. If this was like a three Pain. months ago, and we said, "All right, here's our bold predictions. We're putting our faith in the Tigers, the Mets pitching, and a Powerball winning uh, prediction." I mean, that's really something. I mean, well, that's we, there's really there's cool. reasons no, you could say on something. The other seen. two. Rich is basing it on pulling the a diamond out of his rear so he can brag about it. If it, it happens, and, if it happens, and I essentially have you get uh, no what, bragging four rights. Games no, you you get happen, no bragging rights. Fantastic. No, we will go What are the odds episode, of that anyway? Can you even bet on that? And you'll be like, no. holy crap, Rich is a wizard because he predicted no a one's... walk-off home run for the first time in over 30 years. And that was a bold prediction. I don't care what you guys say. You know That's what's a bold, bold prediction? prediction? People killing off John Sterling in the chat right oh. now. That's a bold prediction. <laughs> That's a horrible Christ, prediction. Guys, I love you guys, but here. man, <laughs> got off. morbid in the chat. Walk off Homer to win the All right, World let's Series. Do the All right, bold predictions across the board. Obviously, Bobby Witt Jr. Uh, leading the AL average at 330. That's what Chris got right there. Uh, that'd be cool. Again, Kansas City is back a that up. Central there. Wow, so, uh, Blake Snell! Nope, breaking giant. news. Oh, well, breaking well, news. Then we have to stop exactly what we were trying to do because uh, that just happened. Holy crap! Blake Snell to the Giants. Uh, looks like a two-year deal. Credit to the chat for points out. Two years, sixty-two million dollars with an, an opt-out. Opt out. Yep, according that's to yep. John yep. Heyman. Um, as well, so and that, the talk all weekend was the Giants or the Astros. And it. First, yeah. it was the Astros in the first half of the weekend. Then yesterday morning, I think the news started to break where they really cooled off, and that the Giants could be the favorite now. Um, it was really those two teams, and even though they shot it down, I mean the Yankees were in the conversation at least a week ago, where you know it was debating if they could go for them. So really did make sense. So it's going to be one of these two teams in the end. Uh, and listen, I mean, for the Giants, it's a good pick. I mean, the Giants, you're uh, trying to do something. And now, now you just got Jordan Montgomery. And will Jordan Montgomery sign by the time we do this show next week? That's going to be interesting, too, to see if that happens. Wow. It's been a while since we actually broke some news on the show, right? Yeah. I mean, thanks to the chat. Absolutely. To the best chat in, in, in YouTube right here, breaking the Blake Snell to the Giants to us. Uh, really cool stuff. And again, what was that? 262. That's what Alex has here. My guy, Hitman. So there you go. And a lot of uh, uh, Yankee fans are happy. Thank God. No more snow to the Yankees talk. Ghost is happy. Well, I'm happy. And I don't have to waste the bench spot for two months now. Also true. Yeah, that's true too. And shout out the future. Can finally get some sleep. All right. So there you have it. Uh, our bold predictions, our world series predictions, all our predictions and Blake Snell to the giants. What a show at nine 23. Uh, let me give you the follow. Let me give you the, the follow suite over on X. And uh, Hey, if you haven't already, make sure to join our 3000 plus followers. On X at ESB Podcast is the handle. You give us a follow individually at G Gory, at JR Pugs, at Rich J Rivera, and at T Waspel. And make sure to give our subsidiaries a follow as well. If you're a Met fan, there are not many of you in the chat. 
There are not many of you listening, but if you know any Met fans, have them give us a follow at ESPNYM, where Joe and Corey are handling that X account, and me and Tom are overseeing the at ESPNYY account for extra Yankees content. So give us some love over on the platform. I do have some upcoming announcements for our next few episodes. Next week, we'll be back here, 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern time, right here on YouTube, among our other three platforms. Uh, and we're doing our live reveal of our outfield. Now, Joe, I know you discussed it a little bit earlier. Mm-hmm. Do you want to discuss uh, what we got in store for the fans for the live rankings? Yeah, listen, This th- these videos are YouTube exclusives, but we are breaking down the top 10 at each position right now for the 2024 season. They're debuting on YouTube. The first episode is up uh, uh, for our first baseman. The second episode is debuting tomorrow at 10 a.m., so you guys will be able to watch it during your work day, during lunch, whatever you guys are doing. It will be on YouTube exclusively. It's a pre-recorded show. It's not It's not a live show. So you can go there and, and view it at your pleasure. Don't forget to drop a like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We need subscribers. I think we gained like six or seven tonight alone, which is awesome. But make sure you go do that. And we will post the graphics up. We love the conversation. Keep the comments rolling. But we're also going to have each position debuting over the next week and a half. So keep an eye out for them, and you'll get alerted when they drop. Corey, the fun continues for Episode 78, our Season 3 premiere. Uh, anything cool we got over there on uh, on that big episode? And listen, it's not an April Fool's joke. We will actually be live on April 1st. That's our Season 3 premiere. I can't believe it. We're in our third season opening day. I mean, listen... Our teams open up the Thursday before, so we're going to have a full weekend set by the time we do that show. We're going to kick off the regular season, talk about that weekend, talk about the season that's upcoming. We may even have a surprise guest, so Mm -hmm. uh, we'll let you all know who that guest may or may not be as we get a little closer to that April 1st date, but it is not an April Fool's Day joke. We are actually going to be live for season three. To touch on Corey's point, we do have verbal confirmation from that guest. Uh, so again, once we get a little closer, by this time next week, we are going to reveal who that special guest is going to be for that big episode 78. And then Tom, uh, when we get into the regular season, there's a segment we're bringing back called Head to Head. What's Head to Head all about in episode 79? Yeah, so Head to Head uh, is, is pretty pretty straightforward theory. We're gonna we're gonna go head to head, Mets Yankees position by position, and we'll say uh, who would you rather take, Pete Alonso or, or um, Anthony Rizzo at first base, and then we just we go around the horn. Uh, do the rotation, do the bullpen, I believe, as a whole. Then we do the rotation as a whole. Um, and just figure out what's what is the best, uh, who's the best at each position in the uh, in the Big Apple. What is happening to John Sterling in our chat? Poor guy. I'm not putting any of those chats up. But, uh, yes, Tom, that that's going to be a fun episode. Really going to get the, the Subway series here on YouTube. We're head-to-head in three weeks' time. And then episode 80, in a month from now, on April the 15th, we are going to have our 200 subscriber giveaway show to thank all our supporters for, for pumping the numbers up to 200. Uh, it was a slow burn to get there, but we are rapidly, hopefully, hitting that 300 real soon. Every time we hit another 100 subscribers, we're going to have another giveaway episode. So well, I don't, I'm, I'm not committing to that. Not 100. But every milestone will probably the next one will be 500. Turned it down. Wow. Okay. All Be right. So, uh, Richard. I was ready to give away just like scraps over here, I guess. But all right. But anyway, we have a 200 mm. subscriber giveaway episode. Coming this up this Philly's eight. koozie is available <laughs> if, if Corey or Joe <laughs> don't want it. <laughs> it's going to be better all than right. that. But uh, that is all. It's pretty uh, good Corey, koozie. It worked uh, really well for me. Corey, why don't we, we send the thank you trade around? Oh, listen, I want to thank everybody in the chat. It was a great episode today. I want to thank the three of you as well. Obviously, all our listeners, whether you're chatting or not, really fun show. And I also want to thank the calendar because it is light past 7 p.m. And this is our last full week without baseball for the Mets and Yankees, at least. Joe? Yeah, thank you for all the people who joined us in the chat. I think we peaked at 85 tonight, which is great. Love the support. Love the chat. Don't forget to subscribe to YouTube, and we'll see you next week. Omas. Yeah, uh, I look back to Phillies for giving me this great koozie. And Joe and Corey can thank me about that later. Thank you, Tom Spuzzi. Thank you to all of you again about the 80, now 86 of you who joined us. That poor guy joined us at the very end. But you can join us here next week, 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. We'll be back for another edition of Empire State of Baseball. Thank you so much. Enjoy the game and take care.